Hey y'all, welcome and welcome back to my channel. It's me, Kia Simone, and let's get into this episode of Who's Touching Who at Real Housewives of Potomac. Child, it's a mess. They got HR claims flying all over the place. Let's just get into it. Before we do, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you have not already. And of course, I have to give a shout out to my super thanksers. Thank you so much to Yvette Greer, Kimmy's Creations, and Tanya Fuller. Now let's get into it. So the episode opens up with Candace going off on the producer about Michael Darby is available. If y'all are looking for somebody to go bobbing for asses, but what y'all ain't gonna do is play with my husband. And the producer's asking her, well, girl, why, why is you telling me? Candace said, because I know you in on it. I know y'all know what's going on. And he said, I got as much control over them and what they say and do as I have over you and what you say and do. And if I had any control, you wouldn't have me in this damn corner right now. Candace said, well, shit, you at least gonna hear me out. So Candace goes on to make the point that Michael Darby is actually on record assaulting people. And these ladies treat him like their favorite delivery driver. They'd hug him right now if they saw him. And of course, they showed uh, the footage of Giselle specifically. Happy to see and hugging old Dirty Darby. So Candace is going on about how they make excuses and apologies for Michael Darby. And Ashley overheard Candace talking to the Section 8 people about her man and got scared. Ashley said, um, is Candace okay? Why, why is Candace in the corner? What, what's going on? And Giselle lying. At, yeah, she fine. She fine. Candace said, Candace is fine. I can hear you. Everybody's all kind of confused and like, well, why why is she in the corner? What's going on? And Giselle, knowing she done started this, but she just, she's talking. She's talking. So Candace asked the producer, help me understand how my husband became the target. He said, girl, my name Bennett and I ain't in it. I don't know. Y'all all talk about each other. I guess they ran out of husbands to talk about. Now they talk about yours. Candace said, yeah, we might all talk about each other, but the difference is I say stuff that's true. So, don't cut none of my fourth wall out. All this shit, I just sit here and talk to you, put it in the episode. Candace dropped the mic and sashayed away. And in the confessional, she said, I decided to take my black ass and leave. Let me tell you something. Um, when a black person is in a professional environment or an environment where they would typically code switch and uh, they come out of their professional mode and start talking to you about their black ass, Th that's the first alarm that you is in trouble. And Candace said the same thing. Candace said, yeah, if I didn't go ahead and sashay out, the alternative was they was gonna get ra-ta-ta-ta, Candace. It was, it, was, it was about to go down. And she wasn't gonna give Giselle that. She said, not today, Satan. Not today, neck. Not today ankles. I said, well, damn, what's, what happened to Giselle ankles? So while Candace is off making her HR complaint, Wendy is talking to the group about how she just recently met with Peter Thomas and they're talking about going into business together to do this Nigerian lounge. Well, Sharice is kind of skeptical about it because a restaurant, a lounge is a major commitment. It takes a lot of work and a lot of time. Wendy says she ain't really worried about that because it ain't going to be my commitment and my time because it ain't going to be my restaurant. I'm only going to be a 20% owner. Ashley said, well, yeah, 20% uh, is still a coin. That's still your coin and you're going to still need to have your eye on it because we know her and Michael had that old kangaroo restaurant that about took them out. Ashley must have had a flashback because Ashley asked Wendy, well, what if your and Eddie's relationship suffers because of you investing in this restaurant? And she said, well, I, I ain't really got to that part yet because I told the man that I'm talking about investing $300,000. And she said the reason she hasn't told him yet is because he is overwhelmed with her being overwhelmed with stuff that she's starting and not finishing. And so he wants her to manage and finish some of the projects she already has on her hands before she starts something new, especially $300,000 new. So amidst all this, Giselle decides this is the perfect time to address her issues with Mia. So she says to Mia, you know, I sent you a text after the spring fling and you left me on red, but I didn't want to leave it like that because I actually like you. And Robin said, hey, 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 look, that's enough going on in here. Take that and go somewhere else. Cause y'all is already awkward and uncomfortable and I don't want no parts of this. I always get dragged into your shit, T take it over there. So they grab half the cupcakes off the table and go off to some side room to finish 
whatever they got going on, leaving Robin, Wendy, Sharice, and Ashley to talk. And Ashley is saying that she feels like Giselle is getting thrown under the bus for sharing a sentiment that several of them felt. She wasn't the only one that felt like this. Ashley said, we all kind of felt like there was something fishy about it. Wendy said, well, for her, she wanted to give Mia the benefit of the doubt because unfortunately she had recently lost a friend to cancer. However, she did feel like if it wasn't true, it's something that Mia should have cleared up by now because you don't want to leave that kind of cloud hanging over you. Robin, Robin ain't with the shits, okay? Robin might have been depressed last season, but Robin said, no, I'm going to wait this season. Robin said she might be going through something, but her post was confusing. You don't throw the cancer center out there like that and not follow up with an actual answer or result. It was misleading. And we see Giselle telling me of the same thing in their separate conversation. Giselle says, you know, have I been confused by your post on social media? Yes. Yes, I have. But is it my business? No. Mia says to Giselle, I never expected that you would be the one to attack me in a group setting. Well, why not? When you met her in a bear fight with Karen, you exchanged numbers with the lady right after her and Karen dragged each other to hell. Like, why, why, why would you not expect it from her? Mia said, I expected that from new booty Wendy, but she didn't even do that. Now, see... You're going to have to leave the plastic surgery shade in your back pocket because you got to build a bare testimony. So I'm going to need you to stop. While Mia is dragging Wendy to Giselle, Robin is about to drag Wendy to her face. Wendy said she wanted to give Mia the benefit of the doubt. However, things have since happened that have made her kind of question things and wonder what's going on. Robin said, well, well, why in the hell was you playing like we crazy then? She said, if you had questions yourself, why did you come into the spring fling trying to put it off on me and Giselle? What did those two say? What did those two say? Wendy is trying to deny that she ever tried to pull Robin into the conversation. And of course, we see the clip that she did. She was asking, was it just Giselle that said this or was it Giselle and Robin? She, uh, you absolutely did, Wendy. So Wendy keeps trying to cop out by saying, I never said your name. I never said your name. Robin said, we know you was talking about me and you tried to drag me in this. So Wendy goes, oh, I don't understand where all this aggression towards me is coming from. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Not Wendy. I know not Wendy calling nobody aggressive when she said you can't call her aggressive when she's being aggressive because it's a trigger word and a dog whistle. I know not Wendy. Robin ain't going for the deflection. Robin said, why did you come over with the what did those two say when you had the same sentiment? Wendy said, for the record, we did not have the same sentiment. You called her a liar. Sharice said, you know what? Hold on. Y'all is arguing a little bit too hard to be arguing about somebody else's lie. There has to be something deeper here. Wendy is still defending herself about when I saw Mia at the party, I asked her, was she okay? Y'all's energy was a lot different. Meanwhile, Giselle is off to the side talking to Mia, owning that her delivery was horrible and apologizing for it. Hell might be freezing over. Mia said, well, damn, that, that was unexpected, but I do accept it. And going forward, if you have questions for me, just come ask me. Now, while Giselle and Mia are in the room making up, Robin and Wendy are in the lobby falling out. Robin is saying that I did ask if she was okay first and then I went on to tell her that her credibility was questionable and we don't know what's going on. Wendy starts going off about, but you called her a liar. Stand in your truth. Stand 10 toes down in your truth. Everything I say, I stand behind it. Robin jumps up, I'm standing on it. Wendy says, sit down. Child, Baltimore County ain't got nothing on me. Now, let me tell you something. I ain't much of a betting woman, but uh, I am willing to bet that Robin would turn Wendy into a mob. Robin said, yeah, I'm gonna sit down because you said so, girl. Girl, go to hell. At this point, Mia and Giselle have re-entered the conversation and, and we done squashed our beef and y'all out here about to snatch each other by the wig. What is going on? So Ashley is trying to find some peace since, you know, this is her TikTok class. She probably got some deposit she need to get back and y'all acting like y'all gonna tear these people place up. So Ashley tries to change the subject and she asks 
Mia and Giselle, how their conversation went. And if Mia's cancer has been ruled out. And Mia said, yes, malignancy has been ruled out, but she does still have to have surgery to have these few lumps or growths that she has on her body removed, but at least they're not malignant. Robin's still pissed off from Wendy. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy for you. That's, that's real good and all that. Uh, I just want to clear up something. Let's, look, I like you and all that. I really want to get to know you, but sometimes I just don't feel like I'm getting the truth. That's just what it is. Mia said that's fair, and I understand. So to begin their Operation Men Fences, Robin says to Mia, well, you know, both of us have sons. Both of our sons like basketball. Maybe we should get our sons together. And she starts going around the group asking about their kids' schedule and when they're on spring break so that she can do a family fun day to invite all the girls and their kids. Except Wendy's. So as Robin is telling all the girls about how her kids really want a family fun day and she's really looking forward to this, Wendy said, oh, that's so sweet. Like, bitch, I'm here too. You, who, who is you playing with? Robin looked at her like an intruder. Why, why, why are you here? Cherie said, is she not invited? Robin said, hell no. Everybody is low-key shocked. And like, what, what do you mean? No, why, why not? Robin just sat there and Giselle said, I mean, it's, it's all good. Wendy said, kids is where she draws the line. She said, it's a character flaw when somebody invites everybody's children and then purposely does not invite yours, but it's fine. Robin said, you can call me a horrible person. I don't give a damn. I've been called worse. And in the confessional, she said, I'm not opening my mouth to ask her about her or her kids availability. I'm 100% good not having her in my life. Personally, if it were me, I wouldn't want to leave kids out, especially in a setting where they're probably going to see on TV that they were left out. However, rejection is protection because if this person does not like you and they don't like you to the degree that they are willing to demonstrate that with your children, your children don't need to be around that. So they're all getting ready to leave. They are over it. Ashley finally asked, why y'all think Candace went stomping out like that? Like, y'all think she told the people about me and Michael? Giselle comes out of nowhere. I think her stomach was hurting. Girl, what? Now, Giselle, no, she done went and stirred up a cauldron full of shit and playing just as dumb. I don't know. I think her stomach was hurting. So they all hug and make their departures. It's time to go. Wendy is leaving the building and the producer runs her down. The producer stops her and says, oh, hey, Zen Wen, so how are things between you and Mia? Wendy said, I mean, we're okay. I mean, outside of me and Karen, I'm probably the only person who's actually trying to give her a chance. But she's lying anyway, so I mean, who cares? We all know she's lying. And then she realized that she was still might. They flash back to 20 minutes ago when she was denying all doubt and calling Robin out for calling the girl a liar. So you did all that for what? Now that production has sufficiently proven that Wendy is absolutely full of shit, we move on. We see that Candace done stomped out of this TikTok party and right on home. She is in the kitchen FaceTiming the IVF nurse because she's starting her treatments. And she's home alone, Chris is at work, and she has to give herself these injections. And let me tell you, I can't stand a needle. I could see me just falling out in the middle of the floor. Ja -ooh, ja. I do think it's really courageous of her to be going through this journey, period, because that's a major decision in and of itself. And to be going through this journey publicly and transparently is a whole nother level. So, you know, I really wish her the best and I hope it all works out for her. So we move on and we see Karen and Ray and they are out for a self-care day. They're going to get manicures and Karen tried to tell the nail tech to give Ray a pink manicure. Ray said, you might be bringing in the check now, but the buck stops here. That's what you're not going to do. You ain't going to play with me. Karen says she's sorry she missed Ashley's TikTok class, but with everything going on in the world right now, a 102 degree fever requires some sort of investigation. So she, she gone on to the doctor, whether she really had a fever or not, we don't know, but we know she was not at that party where Sharice was at. So Ray is telling Karen, you know, this is really nice. Do you do this all the time? Hell yeah. Where you think the money been going? 
She said, yes, I take care of me. I don't, I don't know what you've been over there doing. He said, oh, that's why you always looking so good. In other words, who are you out here trying to catch? Kara said, well, yes, that, that might be why I look so good all the time. But let me ask you, um, does the fact that I do take care of myself and keep myself up and looking good, does that make you jealous in terms of other men? Does it make you insecure like other men might be looking at me? Ray, do not mess this up. He sent Karen into an absolute tizzy when she asked him, do you still love me? This is her rephrasing the question. Do not mess this up. Ray said, well, you know, all men are somewhat insecure when it comes to having a beautiful woman. Karen, are, are, are you serious? Ray said, you know, as a man, we kind of got to make sure that other men aren't attracted to you, if you will. But you've always kind of been attracted to other men and other men have been attracted to you. Karen looked like, why is you telling all my damn business in front of this nail lady? Karen said, hold on, let's talk about this because they already been dragging me in this group, but I got a blue eyes and all kind of stuff. Wait a minute now. You said I could have eye candy. Remember you had told me that I could have eye candy in our marriage, so you okay with that, right? Ray said, yeah, I mean, I'm good with that as long as candy is just candy. Now, now Ray, um... Y'all might need to find some other terminologies because uh, you eat candy. You don't just look at the candy and leave it on the shelf. You actually consume it. Candy, groceries, all that stuff. People people eat them shit. They, they consume those things, Ray. But let me get out these grown folks' business. They've been married a long time. Y'all run y'all marriage like y'all run y'all damn marriage. We moving on. So we move on and we see Ashley out house hunting with her brother, they are looking at this beautiful, spacious home. She's meeting with the listing agent for the house and her buying agent, a lady named Natalie, who actually works for Michael. Ashley said she has actually put in three offers on three different houses already, and every time they get beat out by a cash offer. Ain't Michael supposed to be a 20 millionaire? Why, why, why aren't y'all doing a cash offer? offer. Well, production got questions. They said, Ashley, you might be too dumb to ask, but we, we got several questions. First of all, does Natalie actually work for Michael? Ashley said in so many words, yes. Michael contracts her to do different jobs, but she has known Natalie for as long as she's known Michael, so she's very comfortable with her. And you's a damn fool. This lady literally works for Michael. You met her through Michael. Her loyalty is to Michael. Her paycheck comes from Michael. Do you see that there's some sort of conflict of interest? She's not here for you. Production said, all right, next question. Have you and Michael considered making a cash offer since y'all keep getting beat out by cash offers and y'all supposedly got a bunch of cash? Ashley said, well, no, because... Michael doesn't think it's a very financially sound decision to do a cash offer, and neither do I. And there's actually three really good reasons, but she couldn't recall any of them. So she just threw refinancing out there. They might not be able to refinance in the future. Girl, what? I The house is $1.5 million. Y'all supposedly got $20 million. And rather than buy this house cash, be free and clear, pay taxes and insurance to keep it. Y'all would rather go buy a loan from the bank, which means you're going to pay the principal cost of the house plus all of the finance charges, interest, all this stuff. And you'd rather pay all that money and have some sort of a mortgage over an extended period of time rather than owning a home free and clear. No, fool. It's to keep you on a string. You can't default on a paid off house. You cannot pay the insurance. You cannot pay the taxes and lose it to tax. But you can't default on a paid off house. If I have a mortgage on this house and you can't afford to pay the mortgage, all I got to do is threaten to not pay it. The difference is you can probably afford the taxes and insurance on this house by yourself. The mortgage taxes and insurance, probably not. It's a ball and chain. Do not let your castle become your dungeon. 
So of course they walk through the house. It's an absolutely beautiful home. Ashley loves this house and she wants to put an offer on it, but she's telling them that it's going to come down to what Michael thinks and what Michael says. She said, you know, of course we're talking about getting separated, but Michael didn't really want to put that out there for the sake of securing financing. Natalie said, well, I, I already talked to the bank. I, I got everything I need to move forward. I don't know what you talking about. And Ashley is shocked. Yeah, because he's bullshitting you. Production said, well, now we got another question. Why are you so surprised that Natalie is telling you the financing was already secured? And she's saying that Natalie telling her that is now making her start to side eye Michael because Michael done told her that the financing was contingent on their marital status. Baby, it's based on money and credit. You could be married to a moose. Them people don't give a damn. Do you have our money? Natalie knew just what time it was. Natalie eased right on up out of there. I ain't got time for this. All I want is commission. I don't want no smoke. Natalie leaves and leaves Ashley with this revelation that you is the only one in the dark. And she starts talking to her brother about being overwhelmed with the idea of being a single mother and that she wonders if she's making a mistake sometimes. Let me tell you, I'm not the one that typically would encourage people to just leave their partner or leave their marriage. But Michael Darby, all Ashley got to do is get away from that predator, get a taste of freedom and heal her daddy issues. And she'll know you absolutely are not making a mistake, please. So we move on and we see Robin at home fussing at her house full of testosterone about tearing up her damn kitchen in her brand new house. She said they're actually getting back to the kind of home that they had before their foreclosure and their financial breakdown and that they really appreciate it in a different way now. She's getting ready to have some work done in an office that she has in the home. So she's bringing everything out of the room and going through some files and calls Juan in to go through these files with her. Well, in all these files they're going through, she pulls a file out of her phone where her mama sent her a picture from their wedding and asked her, is there any chance of a repeat of this? So Juan is looking at the picture and Juan asks Robin, do you still have your wedding dress? Robin said, no, I got rid of it shortly after I decided to get rid of you. And since we're talking about weddings, now that I brought that up, um, what you think about us getting a prenup? Juan said, what the fuck? What? what? And then he caught himself. He said, you know what? I don't care. I don't care. Robin said, no, seriously, how do you feel about that? Juan said, well, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, I make more money than you anyway. Robin just sat there and looked at him. Child, that's one of them times you just got to let them have it. Yeah, yeah, baby, you make all the money. Uh-huh. It don't matter who make more money. The bills is paid. That's all. So the producer asked Robin in the confessional, is that accurate? Robin said, no, he didn't say that. He didn't say that he makes more money than me. I mean, he might have said that he will eventually make more money than me, but he didn't say that. So Juan starts asking Robin, well, why didn't this come up years ago? Why are you asking for a prenup now, but you didn't ask for one the first time we got married? He said, yeah, because I remember when I brought it up and you were taken aback. So why do you want one now? So in the confessional, Robin says, well, yeah, I did agree to a prenup the first time around, but by the time we got divorced, it wasn't even necessary because we were broke. So, you are the cause of y'all's financial downfall. You become the breadwinner to rebuild y'all financially. And then you want to protect you from him doing to you what you did to him. So, Robin is explaining to Juan that the reason she wants a prenup is to prevent any issues if they choose to get divorced again. Because it got kind of ugly the first time they got divorced. Juan said, how? Because didn't you just say we was broke? Robin said, well, I think you were seeing someone at the time that might have made things a little more difficult. Juan says, just stop. Stop right there. You know Juan will check out of a conversation in a heartbeat when you start talking about his indiscretions. Robin said, well, listen, before you check out, the reason I brought that up is so that it doesn't seem like the only reason I want a prenup now is because I have businesses. Juan said, well, that's what it seems like. Juan said, you know, I'm really happy for you and everything that you've accomplished and I wouldn't come after that. Robinson, I don't think you would. He said, okay, so then what's the reason? Robinson, you just never know. Shit, I don't think you would, but you could. So we should get a prenup.
Juan ain't willing to go back and forth about it. Juan said, get you a piece of paper, write down whatever you want to write down, divide it all up, and we'll sign it. I don't give a damn. I really get Juan's sentiment. I get Juan's, like, damn near checking out. Because how do you financially sabotage me, rebuild your financial profile, and then treat me like I'm the problem? So we move on and we see that Wendy is visiting a dermatologist because she's having some hair loss. Now she got her a new body and she want to do bald head ho but she, she don't want to be a bald head ho. She's been experiencing a lot of thinning since her last baby and the doctor talks to her about her lifestyle and stress and the effect that stress has on your body including your hair. Wendy being the queen of stress says stressed is the only way she knows how to operate. Well, well, you're going to have to find you another mode of operation, child. That's, that's just not a good way to be. So the doctor tells her she's going to need to adjust her lifestyle and gives her a couple treatment options to choose from. And we move on. So we move on and we see Robin and Mia getting together for lunch to clear the air. Mia comes in and tells Robin she's been drinking for the last 24 hours and she just wants to keep the train rolling. So you're on a bender. They talk about the whole incident and Robin expresses to Mia that she felt bad for Giselle's approach, but she does still have her own confusion regarding what exactly is going on with Mia. Mia lets her know, well, I've had some biopsies, but I still have to have these lumps removed and I didn't provide an update online because there was no update to provide. I, I, I don't know what's going on. And Robin says, well, therein lies the issue. Do you see where for us, we have to figure out, you know, once you start sharing where do you stop? Mia says she understands, but she sums it up by saying, well, she just decided to put it out there because she's an open book. Well, well, the thing is, Mia, who, who was asking to read? Robin said, all right, well, since you're an open book, go ahead and read me your story, Audible. What's going on with these lumps you have? Mia just looked at her for a minute and said, well, I have one on my aunt. Would you like to see it? We, we can play show and tell. So Robin changes the subject and asks Mia, have you heard about what's going on between Candace and Giselle? And she says, well, yeah, I saw when Candace stomped out like she was 12. And Robin brings Mia up to speed about what's going on between Candace and Giselle and her accusations about Chris. Mia said, well, I have something to add. Here we go with the bullshit. Mia said when they were at the spring fling party, she saw Chris out of her peripheral vision. And he was staring at her. So I was like, hi. And she kept catching him. He kept staring. You don't just keep staring at people like that. Production shows us the footage of Chris absolutely not looking at Mia. Mia said it was awkward. Yeah, it looked like it was awkward. Because it looked like you were trying to get his attention and he wasn't giving it to you. And production showed more footage of Chris still not looking. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't paying you no mind. Why you, I'm shaking it, I'm shaking it. Could you shake it over there? Mia says, so maybe there is some truth to it. Robin looked at her like she is out her natural mind. Robin said, you know what, I don't know. I like Chris and Candace. I don't even want to go there. I just, child. Uh... Now when Karen drags Gordon for drooling over her like a dog at dinner time, when y'all were on that couple's trip last season, don't say nothing. So we move on and we see that Giselle is stopping by Karen's house, which is a first in a very long time. She comes in breaking all the damn rules, about to stomp all over Karen's white rug with her shoes on. Karen had to take them orthopedic sneakers off before you come walking all over my white rug. Thank you. Giselle is all excited about being at Karen's house. Karen looking at her like, girl, this is work. Okay. Karen said, these are baby steps. Me and Giselle are trying a new path. I don't trust her ass. But so far, so good. So Giselle starts out by trying to show Karen what she missed at the TikTok class and gives her a demonstration from 80s aerobics hell. If you don't get up off this damn floor. So she finally peels herself off the floor and told Karen that they have a lot to discuss. Karen said, yeah, Ashley and Mia let me know that you and Candace had a moment. Karen said that what she heard was disturbing, that there is not a comfort zone as far as Giselle is concerned with Chris. Uh, and that Chris probably thinks that she's more comfortable with him than she is. And he probably owes her an apology. Giselle said that's her issue. She just feels like she's due an apology. Now, while Giselle is telling Karen her side of events, we see Candace and Chris out to lunch and they're talking about her progress with the IVF, that her body is not really responding to it. 
And Chris is telling her not to stress that it's still early in the process. And she said, well, uh, stress is what I do because the Giselle situation is really stressing me out on top of everything else. So Candace, of course, asked Chris, how does he feel about it since, I mean, is your head on the chopping block? And he says, you know, initially he was angry because he does not like the idea that something that wasn't anything is being made into something that it wasn't. And that's not his personality. That's just not how he gets down. He does his best to try to make everybody comfortable. And he now realizes that you can think you're doing everything right and you can really be doing your best to make people comfortable and it's just not working out that way. But when people start using terms like setting up and luring, certain verbiage and word usage can be upsetting. Chris said he didn't even ask to go to her room. He asked to talk to her and she suggested going to her room. Chris is telling Candace that he's 99% sure that it was Giselle that suggested going to her room. Giselle is telling Karen that Chris asked to go to her room, that he came up to her, asked to talk, suggested that they go to her room, and when they got to her room is when she realized the glam team was gone. So we see both of them giving their sides, and they're both saying that when they got to the room and realized that nobody was there, Chris said it was his suggestion to leave the door open, and then Giselle is saying that she suggested to leave the door open because she didn't want anybody to think anything, and it was going to be his word against hers about what happened in this room, and uh, first of all, I thought this was all backstage in a dressing room at the reunion, so this was in a hotel room. Karen said, I, I got a question. How did this go from y'all were just going to have a conversation to it's going to be my word against his? Where, where are you coming from with that? Karen said, you and Chris are friends. Did he touch you in any way? Giselle said, no, he did not touch me. She said, did he say anything that made you feel like? Giselle said the fact that it was happening at all. What I do remember saying to myself is I don't feel good and I want him to leave. Karen said, did you say that to him? Giselle said, well, what I asked him was to go see if they were ready for me to come back. Karen said, did he do it? She said, yes, he immediately left. Karen said, well, there we go. There you have it. And Chris is talking to Candace and saying maybe she was uncomfortable and I didn't realize it. But I mean, she also references my penis every chance she gets. Karen tells Giselle, listen, we all have to be careful as a group. This ain't the kind of thing you play with. Karen tells Giselle, you know, I actually did have an experience with another husband in the group where he hugged me and squeezed me uncomfortably tight. That was touching. That was uncomfortable. Karen told her, I do understand you being uncomfortable and you have your right to your feelings. Now, here's my thing. Giselle has every right to feel how she feels. And if something made her uncomfortable, she has a right to say that. Now, the fact that Giselle did bring it up to Robin the night that it happened says that maybe she felt a way. Maybe she had a concern. Maybe something did feel uncomfortable for her. And she's entitled to her feelings, but her discomfort does not automatically equate to Chris's being up to no good. Now, I do think if absolutely nothing happened, it is irresponsible to be out here painting Chris out to be this Michael Darby type of character when he didn't do anything to you. It's a dangerous game to play. As Karen said when it happened to her a few years ago with somebody else's husband that made her uncomfortable, the way that she addressed it was she talked to her pastor and her husband, and she came to the conclusion that they just had a little too much to drink. There were witnesses to the event, and so she decided that there was no cause for alarm. That she didn't need to ring the alarm. And the producer asked, well, do you want to share who this husband was? She said, no, absolutely not. Karen told Giselle, you could have brought this up without bringing it up in front of cameras and bringing it to the group. That's where it starts to look like a stunt. Giselle agrees that she could have brought it up off camera, but she's not the one that brought it to the group. Karen said, well, who brought it to the group? Giselle said, Robin Dixon. So the producers asked Karen, well, do you think there's a break happening in the green eyed bandits between Robin and Giselle? She said, hell yeah. Absolutely. And right at that moment, we see that there is a break in the green-eyed bandits. Robin is pulling up on Chris and Candace, just as Giselle is saying that it's Robin's fault that this came to the group. Well, Chris is standoffish because I don't want you to be the next one saying, I tried to touch you. You come up here trying to hug me. Robin said, you gonna hug me today. I, I ain't the one out here talking about you. 
Robin said this is hard for her because she disagrees with Giselle and she does not think that Chris had any intent to be sneaky. Robin started from the Ashley situation. She said, when it comes to Ashley, I don't think you were sliding into her DMs. I think you saw a story and responded to a story. That's where it starts and stops. She said, now with Giselle, in all fairness, Giselle did tell me about this whole thing the night that it happened. But I asked her then, I mean, did he do something? Did he say something? Robin feels like whatever he was saying was out of concern for his wife and Giselle is pretty full of shit. Chris said he's just confused by the whole thing. He said, you know, he's always been pretty friendly and he always hugs them, but he does always wait for them to initiate those hugs and he just does not understand what's going on. Robin said, well, I don't think she was bringing it up to make you out to be this menace to society. Candace said, well, that's how she brought it to me. She came to me clutching her pearls and breathing heavy and like she was afraid, like somebody was going to snatch her drawers. So, and it's bullshit because where was this discomfort at the spring fling party? Robin said she had the same question. Where is this coming from now? And she basically feels like this is spawning out of the fact that Ashley has a story. So since Ashley got a story, Giselle got a story. And since Giselle got a story, Mia got a story. And child, it's a mess. Robin said, you know, I don't know. Where do we go from here? Candace said she got to walk it back. She got to walk back from where she at with that story to here. Unless Giselle walks this all the way back to ground zero, I, I, she don't exist to me no more. She, she, hmm. And the episode comes to an end with Karen asking Giselle the same thing. Where do we go from here? And she said, well, it's been seven days. And I thought I would have gotten a phone call and an apology from Candace and Chris by now, but I haven't heard anything from them. Giselle said, as far as she's concerned, it was just wrong to her. And if it wasn't wrong, she wouldn't have felt it in her gut. And it looks like next week, Wendy is going to be informing her husband of her $300,000 plan. Robin is having her family fun day that Wendy and her family are not invited to. And Ashley and Michael's secret is out. But that's it. That's all. And I ain't got no more. Thank you so much for coming down here, listening to me and letting me get this off my chest. As always, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you have not already. And in the meantime, until next time, just like every time, I love you and I mean it. Bye.